have been some conspiracy drafts that have fired in the shop. So I've been keeping my eye out for some cool foils. All right, guys, round two feature match underway here. On the left, we've got Alec Myers. He's been running roughshod through FNM for the last few weeks with this Naya Super Friends deck. It is a Naya-based Planeswalker heavy deck that's always fun to watch, as Alec only plays decks that are fun to watch. His opponent is Garrett Meadows, also with one win tonight. He is playing American Control, so blue-white splashing red for things like Mizium Mortars. Raul Zarek is a saucy one, Karanos, and Turn and Burn. So Alec finds a brim as, as Garrett answers the Elvish Mystic with an Isn't Charm. Slightly too late, however, as that brim as is now going to uh, threaten to start running over him. Of course, Garrett's deck well equipped to answer a threat like that as he does have Mizium Mortars. And speak of the Devil Mortars does take out the four toughness brim as. Alec follows up with a Domri, ticks it up, but misses. Misses his fourth land drop, and now let's see if Garrett can stabilize. There is a Detention Sphere. Answering the Planeswalker. And he plays a Mute Vault from his hand here, so Garrett in a good spot here. There is a Xenagos that uh, makes a Seder immediately, which starts attacking, so... Alec struggling to keep... Threat's on the board here, but has done pretty good at reloading each and every time. Looks like the Mutavolt's going to serve in at the Xenagos. Knock it down to one, keep it honest. And then Garrett just passes the turn back. We are going low tech as I left my iPod at home tonight because I'm an idiot. Going with the big old dice for life total. So, Garrett just plays the land, passes the turn back. Alec untaps with a Domri. He's got a second Seder now. Figuring out what to do. First things first, he's going to serve in for four. Knocks Garrett down to 13. The follow up is a tap Sacred Foundry and a Pelucranos, which uh, we could all expect was going to mean a counterspell of some sort there. It is a dissolve. Garrett leaves the card on top. Shocking ourselves for a verdict and then follow up with an attack from the Vault clears Alex's board entirely. Alex just not stopping playing Planeswalkers though. Here's a Chandra Pyromaster. Ticks that puts Garrett to 10, but more importantly, gives him another non creature threat. Mutavolt serves in. And Garrett just passes back with four mana up. So Chandra Zero reveals a Courser of Crufix, which Alec plays. There's a Temple Garden off the top and another Courser on the top of his deck. So a lot of value there off of the Chandra. In one turn, Garrett just plays a land and passes back, can no longer attack with his Mutavolt. As the Giant Spire doing a good job of blocking it. So we're going to zero Chandra again. Do need to reveal that top card. There's a Brimaz on top. So Alec deciding what he wants to do. His hand is Zinagod. Another Corsair. A Gore Clan Rampager. It's just nothing but business. <laughs> Alec's deck is chock full of threats. Garrett has done a, a great job of, of neutralizing the majority of them. But this Naya deck is just so strong it can produce a turn 2 Brimaz and then also has all the late game 
business with Planeswalkers and Xenogod, which is a tremendously eff uh, effective. So the Xenogod trigger goes on the Elvish Mystic, and we serve in with the team here for one, two, three, four, dropping Garrett down to six. Garrett reveals the hand of all lands. He did not miss a land drop in that game and had three lands in his hand. So Garrett fought a good fight there, answered a lot of threats early, but Alec just had too much gas. So he takes game one here in a round two feature match. Back at action here, back to the action I should say, as I stumble of my words even before the first card has been played. Garrett Meadows, he's playing American Control, he's down a game, he's on the mulligan to six, leading off with a Boros Temple into a tapped Hallowed Fountain. And his opponent Alec Myers with the turn two Elvish Mystic off the no land that comes into play untapped. So a slow start for both players here. We know that Alec threatens a lot of business at all stages of the game, and the longer the game goes, the more likely Garrett is to find his win conditions and stabilize. Four mana for a Pelucranos here, or is this a Xenagos? It's a Chandra Pyromaster. Tick it up, do one damage to Garrett, that'll put him at 19, and a Banishing Light will take out the Planeswalker. I still, still don't understand why we printed another O-Ring. I understand that it's functionally different, but... Can we not just errata a ring? A million re functional reprints these days. Stormbreath Dragon makes an appearance. Attacks in. Drops Garrett down to 15. He casts a Supreme Verdict to clear Alex's board. He's going to go ahead and scry a card to the bottom. Let's see what his follow up is. It's a Xenagos. It makes a token that comes in tapped in attacking. Knocking Garrett down to 13. There's a D-Sphere for the Planeswalker. We know Alec probably sideboards into some number of destructive revelries. There is two mana for a Ratchet Bomb, which is pretty good at answering uh, this Seder token. Let's see if Garrett wants to cash in that uh, Ratchet Bomb for the Seder. Uh, this is a two-turn clock as it is. I think you probably do it just to save yourself the turn. So Ratchet Bomb does take out the zero cost Seder token. The Storm Breath does get in, drops Garrett down to nine. I like to shock himself at some point, so he's at 18 there. Move the dice down so that I can see them. I'm proud of myself for keeping track. So we need something to kill this Storm Breath. We need an O-Ring effect. We need a Turn and Burn. We need a Mizium Mortars. We need a Supreme Verdict. Any of the things I just said will do. Does not look like Garrett has one. I guess he's debating if he wants to leave this card on top as he is scrying with a Temple of Epiphany. He's down to just one card in hand here. He was on the play, he's on the mole, so just trading one for one here with all the threats in Alec's deck have left him short on resources. Luckily, Alec is two land drops away from being able to monstrous that dragon, so it should still be a two turn clock. And yeah, this is uh, not a good sign for Garrett as he's loading off the Muta Vault. And attacking Alec down to 16. There's a Rurik Thar. That's going to be good enough. Just two. Found it. Low tech. Because my iPod's at home on the end table. Are you trying my brick dice? No, that's upstairs where you left it. Along with your 2D20. Alright, so back to the action here. Bonus coverage here in round two. Still two undefeated players. We saw Nick Reed in round one. He won the Jun Monsters mirror match. He's still playing Jun Monsters, actually, in the second round. His opponent is Joe Lewis, who's playing black-white midrange. So basically a black-white control deck uh, with goodies like Blood Barons and Obsidats. Yeah. The black-white 
deck used to be just in the gear of the devotion deck, except for the librarians instead of uh, grave merchants. Mm -hmm. And then they realized that, hey, all we have to do is add a couple more planes and we can play cards like opposite acts. Well, this just in. Looks like Joe is not, in fact, playing black, white, mid range. That overgrown tomb indicates that he is playing junk. He also is at 18 because of the overgrown tomb. Well, Nick powers out a turn three Xenagos the Reveler. That's going to make a Seder token, which is likely just going to stay right there. No, he doesn't give a crap. He's going to start pounding in. We saw this in round one. Uh, you didn't see it, but uh, the stream and I saw it. As Nick is, mostly, mostly correctly, very aggressive. He just what? goes after the life total rather than worrying about parity, uh, which is probably a correct. There's a new about too. Um, I was about to say, like, it's very odd to see Packrat in the three-color deck. Because the strength of Packrat is followed, uh, to follow discard spells and to have untapped lands going play. Mm-hmm. Uh, a three-color deck really doesn't have that luxury, but Joe, of course, finds the, uh, the mute of all, so they able to keep, keep the pressure up. Mm -hmm. and did not see all of the contents of Joe's hand, but he did flash an abrupt decay, which unfortunately does not answer... It doesn't really effectively answer any of the cards on Nick's side of the table. You can abrupt decay a satyr token for almost no value, but you cannot answer the Zen Ghost, the Karyatid, or the mute of all, all of which get around it in different ways. Five mana for a Storm, Storm Breath Dragon, Dragon. Which, is not yeah. ne which is not nearly as invulnerable uh, against the black base deck as it does have a billion removal spells, one of them being the Hero's Downfall, which eventually takes it out. End of turn, Nick is going to scry with the Temple of Abandon. Joe correctly waiting, uh, he could have got uh, one extra damage on the Xenagos, but Nick actually representing Overload and Missing Orders that turn with a plus one on Xenagos. So we follow up with an Elvish Mystic here. Oh no, not with an Elvish Mystic. Yeah, did, did, follow up. I think he already had it on. No, he didn't already have it on board. I'm losing my mind, Garrett, and it's only it's not even 8 o'clock. So we're looking good for long-term performance, as we've got probably at least four more rounds of this to go. the conspiracy draft going on, right? Yeah, I walked up there to see what was going on in case he skibby said I lost to a turn one sword to plowshares. I don't even know how that could be a thing, <laughs> but he said he did. I think he was using some hyperbole, but uh, I like to I like to envision a scenario in which it wasn't hyperbole and he somehow lost the game to a turn. Lives in the hyperbole. <laughs> he, he does. So here's four coming in. Joe just not going to activate the back rat. Really doesn't want to get blown out by uh, or not blown out. Get, uh, get gotten by Nizzy Mortars. So Joe has missed uh, multiple land drops at this point. Trying to get Zinegos off the board the old-fashioned way by attacking it. That Mutavolt helping out tremendously. But, uh... I don't think he's missed a land drop yet. No, he has not. He just had not played his land drop for this turn. He played the God of Shrine untapped. There's and there's a scavenging you, so Joe with the full on junk deck here. Now, this is a weird there's, no, there's not a splash involved. This is a full on green deck. And Nick, in fact, has a scavenging ooze, and he's got the, more importantly, he has open green mana and the ability to blank Joe's scavenging ooze. Yeah, scavenging ooze pack that is actually a combo. Mm -hmm. but a very slow, uh, <laughs> resource intensive one. It's also weird that he's playing around mortars by not activating his pack grab, but then runs out. Uh, is he really playing activity. around mortars by not activating pack rat, or is he just? Why else wouldn't you? Uh, yeah, he's missed two activations by this point. Uh, I don't know. He might have a different approach. You might not want to pitch any of the cards in his hand. Of course, that seems unlikely. You don't really build your turn two pack rat deck around the idea that well, I can't ever activate it because these yeah, cards are too that's, good. That's another reason uh, that you see in the modern black decks because you can pitch cards like Bow Blight or Devour Flesh if they're dead in a matchup. You don't really want to pitch your opposite deck. Or your abrupt decay. Your mid range deck. Yes. Good, good point. Points. The 5 5 impossible to kill versus the 2 2 or the <laughs> anthem effect on your pack rat. So scavenging ooze takes Joe, out a satyr token. Joe really realizing that he doesn't have the green mana that Nick does. No, if you can get any value off of that scavenging ooze by getting something off the board, seems like it's a, a fair... He does have the abrupt decay for Nick's. Yes. 
but not before Nick uh, goes ahead and uses all of his mana and makes it a 4-4. Four, four. So Joe down to 10, Nick up to 22. Nick well ahead on board here, but we'll see what Joe can muster. He's going to start off by scrying with the Temple of Malady. Get a little bit more information before making decisions about the rest of his turn. Looks like that one's staying on top after a mild debate. He does have on to that mana next turn. Mm -hmm. oh. It was not uh, a long debate, but he did think about that. Uh, there is the abrupt decay that we knew about. We are going to attack in here. Kill the Xenagos. It will, in fact, die. So Joe gets the Planeswalker off the board, not really pulling ahead by any means. Both of these decks can play some Haymakers here, but Obsidat seems to be the real key. If Joe can get an Obsidat into play, it's going to be very difficult for Nick to deal with it. And, uh... Yeah, the only uh, answer that John Munch has is a couple of that's usually the sideboard. Yeah, well, and, and Nick, I think Nick actually plays the, some number of them in the main, but he definitely has them in his board, as he has those made several appearances in his Round 1 feature match against Brandon Hart. Future doesn't really have uh, any artifacts to hit in this format, but still easier to cast in this deck than uh, Heroes Downfall. Yeah, it's it effectively does the same thing for for what I mean. Obviously, it, it uh, can't answer Planeswalkers, but you, your whole deck is full of creatures that can answer Planeswalkers. So. Joe fires off a Sylvan Carry. It's hit. not really going to impact the game all that much. Is that ooze is now big enough that it can uh, come through here? But Joe representing a pack rat activation. What's our graveyard? Looks like that ooze is already maxed out here. So there's another land from Nick. Four mana, five mana. Is this a dragon? It is a dragon. So serve in with all of these guys. That's nine. Yep. And this is interesting here too because like, uh, oh it, wait, is there an ooze? Yeah, I think there's a scavenging ooze in the graveyard, so that that ooze can go up to a four-four. So Joe could double block it, but he would lose his now whole pack rat plan. Joe put the card on top. I'm, I'm assuming it's a removal spell because I don't think he'd keep the carry hit on top. And mm -hmm. that's definitely. Uh, well, Yikes! That, that, that was it. He must have kept the carry on top to cast the Elspeth next turn. What two cards in his hand could be better than the Elspeth? More Elspeths. Good point, but um, yeah, that that might be the, the line. That might be the uh, you might have dedu deduced it correctly there. The uh, keep the pseudo mana source on top. That's why there was a bit of a a bit of a consideration there. So we chump chump the ooze, take some damage from the dragon. We're down to two here for in Joe's seat, and we have uh, multiple threats we need to answer. There is an Elspeth, which we have to minus four. Yeah. And we are still dead, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. Let's see if Nick sees the line. Uh, attack you. Attack uh, you. Now he's off. I make that joke once a week. Uh, <laughs> but that's made there. I think Nick can infer what we inferred in here, which is that Joe had multiple Elspeths in his hand. So we're into game three here. Nick is on the mold of six, but he's on the draw, so he'll get a little bit of that back. There's a mana confluence. That allows Joe to power out a turn to Sylvan Karyatid. And then Nick has no land drop, so... We've this... seen this happen before, and his land that he kept is black red. Green <laughs> the worst. Yeah. Meanwhile, Joe has an abundance of land as he... Uh, or abundance, uh, potential abundance of land as he has a uh, turn, turn to I don't either, turn to Corsair of Cruffix Nick does find another land, it comes into play tapped and he's but he does uh, get to shove a card with his Temple of Abandon, so the is going to serve in here for the first actual damage of the game, dropping uh, Nick down to 18 there's a tapped Godless Shrine, just going to go tick up to 20. But just passes back here, so Joe's uh, hand probably a chock full of six drops in removal spells. We know he has the, it looks like he has a Doomblade, we know he drew a Devour Flesh. 
Looks like a couple more lands. His hand very reactive. So there's the edict is going to answer the scavenging. It is it is very difficult, uh, very interesting. Seems like uh, the deck that does play the wall of, wall of blossoms probably yeah, <laughs> probably is always going to have so edict protection. Yes. <laughs> so there is a temple of malady off the top. We're going to scry. Joe's going to go up to 21. It's another courser. Uh, having two coursers against the aggro deck is very good. <laughs> and there is a scavenging ooze. There's a Sylvan Karyat's It looks like the camera just got real choppy there for a second, so I apologize. I don't know what's going on with that. But Scavenger Jews makes an appearance. It starts taking up Joe, gaining all of the life. He draws the Corsair. He reveals a life bane zombie. This deck's mana base is super greedy. <laughs> He's trying to cast... Uh, Off of that, Corsair, life bane zombie. No big deal. And have enough green mana to activate Scavenger Jews effectively. And don't forget that Elspeth on turn 6, so there is another Corsair. Now the top card of his deck is revealed twice. He's going to go up to 24 off of two Corsair triggers. Plus it's also a Corsair. But watch out, Nick might find his third land this turn. But, you know, still Joe only barely anywhere from the Corsair. Though. There's the Mystic. There's an Acceleration. He can have land plus Mystic. The good news for Nick, though, is that we clearly don't have an option that or an Elspeth, or else we would have just played that card by now. So five minutes remaining in the round now, so uh, both players not only playing against their opponent, but against the Take clock. So here's my hand of goodies. Uh, a Pelucranos hits the bin, as it is the only target. Nick's hand is very good if he could ever get mana to cast his spells. Zinigo, Slaughter Games, or not Slaughter Games, Rakdos' Return, Raska, Abrupt Decay, uh, Putrefy, and Storm Breath Dragon. Oh, that is not a one man keep hand. <laughs> well, we don't necessarily know what he, which of those cards he drew. Right. But, uh... Like three of those cards make that a not... Yeah, it was six. It was six cards on the draw. Mulliganing is very difficult, and it's very difficult to look at it without that, being somewhat. Yeah. Oh, I'll just find another one off my scry. Yeah. No, you will miss, and then you will <laughs> not ever get to play Magic. So an abrupt decay takes out one of the coursers. Sylvan Carrington blocks the other one. So uh, Nick is managing to survive, if nothing else, here. And if he can find a land on the top of his deck, uh, he, I mean, he's in a pretty good spot here, uh, deceptively. You know, I mean, his his hand is very good. Well, it didn't take out a Corsair. What did we take out with the Abrupt Decay? A uh, Scavenging Goose, I'm sorry. So there is a Temple of Malice off the top. We shove another card to the bottom, likely a non-land card. We can play our Xenagos here. No, it is not, but you can tick it up and at least save your life total. I mean, any any damage that's coming at Xenagos is not coming at uh, at you, of course. It's just going to die, because now I realize he has to tap both of his mana doors to do it. So Nick's still in a, a bit of a pickle here. He's a, The only card that was in his hand that we saw revealed from the zombie that he could have cast, he's already cast, that's an Abrupt Decay. We know he drew the Temple of Malice this turn. And the chat has devolved to a discussion over net decks, so. Yeah. Hey, bud. I'm joined by Jonathan Wright. Where your opponent has all big spells in their hands. Yeah. And it's choked on mana. And you know they have that storm breath. Like you would. Go ahead and cast that. <laughs> yeah, stone rain them before they can tap the land in response. Might not matter here as Nick is still hamstrung here. Corsairs and Lifebane get in for six. The Lifebane itself now becomes a uh, a two-turn clock. It's basically treating Nemesis. Yes. So there's a Mutavolt. That's five mana. We can make a Vraska that can kill the Lifebane zombie. We survive a turn. Yes. So that's our play, and then we hope we draw a Mizium Mortars. No, Joe's not drawing off the that. But how is this the thing that we're doing? What is this? What does this represent? Ugh, Desecration Demon. 
every time there's a card revealed off the top of Joe's deck, I'm, I'm mortified. I'm just no, it's not like it's not like any of these are. Uh, well, then these are legal. They did reprint that in Conspiracy though, which yeah, I think is funny. Colors. Yeah, uh, it's a very good card. So there's the Putrefy. So we knew the Putrefy was in his hand. I for, I had forgotten about it. But it seems to me like you could maximize your mana, cast Vraska, tick it up, kill the Lifebane Zombie. You would only go down to two. Didn't have active Vraska, right? But I don't play Magic. I just uh, talk about the Magic. Connections. Draw a card. Find a land. Right. Now Joe's found all this land. Desecration Demon. What do we need here? Overloaded Mortars? Yes. Overload Mortars, sack my Karyatid to the Demon. It's also a You can play the Vratska and sack the Demon. Or sack to the Demon. We could kill the Demon even. That'd be better. Yes, it'd be a lot better. <laughs> Oops. But he's still dead, right? Yeah. Well, no, he's dead. Here, come, mana, here comes Zinnikos. Make a Seder token. Don't forget in this three color double mana everything. Joe, there's a stack of, uh, yeah, how's he casting that? There's also new vaults. Yes. What? No. Joe's mana base is very greedy. I imagine for every game like this where he has turn two mana confluence and it all works out for him, there's many games where he can he never has one white source, let alone two. Turn two mana confluence into the own character. There's a hero's downfall on top. Oh no. Drop the die. We're going to draw a card off Underworld Connections. Revealing a Doom Blade on top. Nick has had enough. He could have cast a Jocko Hop, so that would have been good in that spot. Yeah. He would have gotten disqualified for a legal card, but. Plane I mean, it's, it's worth it. Yeah, Planar Cleansing. And if he goes to the Joe Lewis School of Deck Construction, he was play, He could play <laughs> Planar Cleansing in his Jun deck. So we needle Joe a little bit there, but his deck obviously good enough to uh, beat a, a very strong uh, Jun Monsters deck. Yes. Nick, uh, remember, mulling to six, keeping a one lander and missing a lot of land drops. 